盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘盘 ，Sidecast。Part three: The Meditations. Meditations three and four. So, last instalment we looked at meditations one and two. We doubted everything that we could possibly doubt. We threw all the apples out of the basket. Sometimes my senses deceive me. Some I might be in a dream. The demon might be deceiving me of every thought that I can have. That was meditation one. In the second meditation, we got the the famous cogito. I think I am. We established that one. I exist, and two, I'm a thinking thing. Then we spoke about some wax for a little while longer.、Um, again, I'm, I'm not quite sure why. But then we move into the third meditation today, where we're looking at quote third meditation: the existence of God. We'll jump right into it. In the opening, he does kind of what he's done in the past. He he talks about、uh, what he's doubted in the previous meditations, what he's established. I've just said he's a thinking thing, and that he exists. And then we're going to think about what it is to be a thinking thing. What kind of things I can think, and what kind of modes of thinking there are. Now it's interesting to get to get to the main core of this this chapter, which is going to be named the trademark argument for God's existence. Descartes needs to do a little bit of groundwork again to to build up to that. And just just to reiterate, at this point, we have no knowledge other than I'm a thinking thing. And and therefore I have thoughts. That that's it. We I can't say anything about the outside world. I can't say anything of of really at all. Even even if it seems so evident that I have a body, I still have to doubt that. So he needs to 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 pick out a couple of key things. And so he starts off by describing what thoughts are, because、uh, I think. It, seeing as he all he knows is he's a thinking thing, he might have to describe what that thinking thing actually consists of. So he gives a couple of modes of thinking, and this is we're already getting into this bit where I might have to stipulate well, what's a mode? A mode is,、uh, according to Descartes, a, an attribute or a, or something that a substance possesses. Now we established in the previous、uh, episode that a sub like a substance for Descartes is what、well, he's established. There is a substance called mind. Now he he also wants to say there is a substance called body, but we can't say anything about that just yet. So, so we have and substance. So substances have modes. Thinking or thought is a is a substance. Mind is substance. And so now I need to talk about sorry the modes of that substance. What are the modes of th- of thinking? Well, he says that the thought consists of ideas, or or he, or he uses the term images. In which case, if you just have the image or the thought of any particular object in front of you, he says that there are affections. So when you, when you say I like or dislike a particular thing,、uh, volitions, where he says that you want something, and finally、mm. judgments, which are the most important, which is when you affirm something to be true or false, and or you or you make a claim that could be true or false. So none of the other things are. are Provable, true or false, in any sense of the word, is、mm-hmm. only once you make a judgment and say, "Ah, there's this coffee cup in front of me right now."、Mm-hmm. Suddenly, now I'm saying something that could be wrong. So that's the type or, or mode of mind that we're most interested in here. And how does that tie into his ideas of what type of thoughts? Like a quote here: "Among my ideas, some appear to be innate, some appear to be、uh, fictitious. I sensed, and others have been invented by me." Yeah, good. So he, he just so we have this category. And judgments, as you just laid out there, there are three types of judgment: factitious, adventitious, and innate. And it, factitious is en- it's just anything that you can make up in the imagination. So obviously things like unicorns and stuff that have no no co-、like、correspondence with anything outside of your mind.、Okay. You you make that up yourself. Adventitious suggests that it has to come from sense experience.、Yep. So let's say with the wax,、uh, I can only know that the wax smells of such and such because. I sense it, and therefore it, it makes an impression on my mind. And innate are the things that he says are known in the mind or discovered in the mind without having to appeal to any sense experience whatsoever. And it's important to say that word discovery there is that he doesn't want to argue that, which is an objection that is pointed to him that says, "Oh well, are these innate ideas supposed to just be there constantly, ever present in the mind?" No,、mm. you you do dis- you discover them. But there is something that you discover in yourself, and nothing, and you don't have to to stretch beyond that. 
So really clearly, three types of ideas. Imagination, i.e. unicorns. Sensed, i.e. wax and, and the smell of wax. Um, three, innate. Example of one might be triangles, three corners, three yeah. sides. Good. Any any mathematical truth like that, or or even the cogito at this point is a, is an innate idea. Right, that's the only one we've actually got. Isn't yeah, it? Sorry. good. So... Andy, the third meditation is called Of God That He Exists. So how do all these categories and stuff relate to eventually where we're going, which is I know the audience, so they're waiting for it. They're like, when's he going to drop the G-bomb? Yeah, well, the, good. So, and the, the reason why all of that preemptive stuff is important is, is that we've now reached this, I, this sense that we have types of ideas and we've been joking or hinting at this idea of clear and distinct. This is where it becomes important, even though I must say that it is not clear and distinct. Sadly, <laughs> it's quite wow. Vague. Uh, so Descartes wants to argue that clear and distinct ideas are, are those that are... So it's clear if it is it, like, that it's apparent in your mind right now. So just imagine an object in your head. Oh, I'm imagining. And, 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 that, and if, it, if it is present mm. there square. firmly, yeah. then it is clear to you. Mm. I can see a square in my mind. But, mm. The important thing here is it doesn't have to be a, an actual image of a particular thing. Oh. An idea could just be... So I think this is where the language use gets problematic is because you want to picture an actual a picture of yeah. a circle or square. Just the concept itself. Do you be like, I'm have, hungry. That you, you have picture. firmly in yeah. your mind. Distinct is something which is that cannot be muddled up with anything extra. For instance, if you do have a concept of a circle in your in your mind and you have it and it's very much in the present forefront of your mind right now, is you cannot in any stretch of the imagination muddle that up with a triangle. Yeah. Nothing can be done to mm. make that a triangle in your mind. Mm -hmm. It's no longer a circle. Yeah, good. And he says that there are examples like pain which might very well be clear, but not distinct. Mm. So I might have a pain in my jaw, which I, I feel the pain clearly, but I, on closer inspection, I can't be, it can't be distinct because I might feel a pain all across my jaw where it might actually just be one tooth that is right. causing the pain. Okay. He says that the only things that are absolutely indubitably true are clear and distinct ideas. Yeah. So if I've got a clear and distinct idea, I know, and this is kind of not really argued for, it's more just stated, and we'll just, can, we'll just kind of play along with it for now, is that if you have a clear and distinct idea, it has to be undoubtedly true. Hmm. So the cogito is, a, is indubitably true. Is that the only indubitably true thing then? Because so far, that's... So our second meditation is, I think, therefore I am. So now adding this new vocabulary to it, saying this is an irrefutable knowable truth is that the only yes one? perfect so uh, i know we use the examples of triangles in mathematics but actually at the moment in his meditations we can't say that for certain yet and that's why this next argument is really important because he ne he needs to be able to say why when i say two plus two equals four that it cannot be a deception right and that's where this next bit comes in Good. I yeah. think it's clear and distinct ideas are ideas that are self-evidently true and beyond doubt. Good. These can't come... So the three categories Andrew laid out or Descartes laid out, these can't be sensed because they can... Well, they can be sensed, but they're not... They don't come from the senses because I can be deceived about them. Mm. They are open to doubt. Mm. The imagination likewise can be open to doubt. Or no, they're not the products of imagination. And here's why. When I think of a triangle... Yeah, you might imagine the shape of a triangle, but then I tell you to think about a thousand-sided shape. It's no longer in your imagination, your mind's eye, but you grasp it through reason alone, through the rationality part of your mind. It's an innate idea, a thousand-sided shape. Yeah, so it doesn't make like sense. The, just like the concept or thought about the number pi is clear and distinct. If you can count to so many numbers of pi, none of us can. But if someone can do that, what's the Daniel Tame, I think the guy is called, who did it to 22,000 degree decimal places of pi. He knows that number. It's clear and distinct for him. Mm. It's not for us. It's perfectly defined. Think about it like that in the same way that Chile had gone the thousand side shape it is. Cool. Is that what it's called? Chiliagon? Yeah, Chiliagon, yeah. yeah. yeah and De but Descartes uses that example in Sixth Meditation as well. If, if ah, jumping again. again. So now, do you uh, want to get to... Well, you, were, you were there, Andrew. The G-bombs yeah, coming. So, yeah, so we're about, to, we're about to get to the trademark argument. The very last thing uh, we need to just establish before we can get understand this logic, because the argument itself is quite easy once you, once you have all of this idea. But So already we've got this sense that the only thing that can be true is clear and distinct ideas. Yeah. 
He then wants to say that there are two ways of thinking about uh, things, which is there's uh, ideas can have objective reality, and this is where it gets painfully annoying, is that objective used by Descartes right now is not the, t- the term objective that you have in your head. So the best, the best word I've seen that is a better description is rather than using the word objective reality, perhaps let's just replace that with representational reality, hmm. as in the, the ra- reality that an idea has in your mind, not in the word that we use objective in, the, in the today's sense that it's something independent of my mind. Hmm. It's actually the complete opposite, which is kind of painfully annoying. Very clear and distinct. Right. So, so we have these ide- like objective reality, representational reality, and this has a hierarchy. So he wants to say that certain things have more fullness in their ideas. Objective reality isn't the idea of the, it isn't the amount of reality the thing has in your mind. That's still formal reality. Objective reality is the amount of reality that the object of the thought in your mind has. Good. So there's formal reality, which is the the type of reality or substantiality or substance that objects have independent of the way we think of them that's formal reality objective reality is consider the object of your thought what type of object is it what type of reality does that have a knife has more formal reality than its sharpness okay my idea of the knife has more objective reality than the idea of its sharpness my thought about the knife has as much formal reality as all of the other thoughts, but for instance, for it, for instance, less formal reality than me. Right? Does that clear, make sense? Clear and distinct. For anybody lost the in the in the confusion, because you've you've explained about as well as it can possibly be explained. This is it's where it gets an, uh, a difficulty here. But hmm. so just a really quick simple thing about objective reality is that he he has the same three tier uh, hierarchy as he does with the formal reality so here's the here's the hierarchy of objective reality for descartes ideas of infinite substance or in other words an idea of what we will we'll call god yeah that's the highest possible idea that you can conceive of you then have the idea of a finite substance which is mind and body those are the only two substances that descartes can can seem to conceive of and also the ideas of modes of those of those substances so when when greg said i have the idea of a knife a mode of that knife for instance might simply just be or the mode of extension when we're talking about that knife could be its weight and its shape and all of that stuff and uh, it's easier when you think about things like color when you're thinking about that so when i picture say uh well i've got one literally in front of me a yellow mug is that the idea of the mug uh, or the yellow mug is is fuller than the idea of yellow independently from any particular object now we've established somewhat what objective reality is the easier part of it is what he calls formal reality which is really what you think about when you hear the word objective in the first place and it's exactly the same hierarchy that he says so in formal reality as in in the outside world as it were there are three types of things infinite substance finite substance and modes of finite substances if you haven't caught all of that the only thing that's really important here to establish what we are finally going to get to which is the argument for god's existence is that descartes makes one very 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 important point which is if you have an idea and we're going to call that something that has objective reality so i have an idea of a mug in my mind is that that must come from an outside source that idea must have had some form of formal reality Otherwise, you have this problem of just, well, I have this idea which came from another idea, which came from another idea. And you just have this infinite regress of, I don't know where the source of this idea comes from. And the final thing he's going to say is, is that whatever idea that you have in your mind that has objective reality must have at least the same amount of formal reality outside of your mind. Okay, yeah. So in summary, then... We have clear and distinct ideas, Mm -hmm. which are ideas which are self-evident or beyond doubt. So they're 100% certain. We have degrees of reality. So formal reality, that's degrees of reality outside in the world. Or uh, degrees of objective reality, which is the type of reality 
the things in my mind represent their objects as having. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we also have Descartes causal principle. And right. when applied to ideas, this says the cause of an idea must have as much formal reality as the idea has objective reality. In other words, the thing that caused my idea must have as much substantiality or reality as my idea of it represents it as having. So the the effect and the cause has to contain something which is in the effect. You can't have a stone. In essence. Okay, cool. Yeah. Awesome. So there's people sat on the edge of the chairs all <laughs> over the world, Andrew, thinking this this is supposed to be the existence of God. That's why I'm here. What's all with this metaphysical mumbo jumbo? Give me the big man whose name starts with G. Hallelujah. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Uh, Preach. I've I've written this up in my own words of just premise, premise, conclusion, just so it to try and make it as clear and distinct as possible. <laughs> Sorry. If that's the to... footnote oh. to this episode, uh, it's clear and distinct. <laughs> Here it is then from the top. <laughs> Trademark argument. <laughs> premise one. I have a clear and distinct idea of God. And that idea has the highest possible objective reality. Mm. As in, it's the highest possible idea that I can possibly conceive of. There is no idea that has a higher quality fuller in any possible way cool premise two i am a finite substance and god is an infinite substance we're talking about formal reality there mm. premise three the cause of an idea must have at least as much formal reality as it does objective reality premise four because i am a finite substance i cannot and this is the important bit i cannot be the cause of an idea with infinite objective reality because i'm finite and that's infinite Therefore, the cause must be from an actual infinite substance and not a finite substance. Consequently, because God is the name we give to an infinite substance, God must exist. Cool. I have a clear and distinct idea of God. God is infinitely X, Y, Z or an infinite simple thing. I've got three ways of arriving at ideas. They could be invented by me. How am I going to invent on its own the idea of infinity? It's particularly when I sense just finite things as a finite being. So there's only one of the places that can come from, an innate idea found in my thinking mind alone, given to me by something infinite. Because like, like Greg pointed out at the end of that little section there, the cause needs, the, the effect, I, my idea of infinity needs, the cause needs to be infinite of itself. How else am I going to reach that? I think it is worth pointing out here just before we move on that when we use the word God, I think Andy very uh, wisely in his language, we're talking about like an infinite substance, right? So we're not necessarily talking about the uh, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu idea of God or the ooh God, the omnipotent, omnibenevolent, omniscient God yet. We will get on to some potential qualities later. But the, at the moment, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, we're just talking about a infinite substance. Is that Yes, right? but as you quite correctly pointed out is that when when descartes does give his ontological argument he he does prescribe a whole bunch of what well, he the most perfect being and because a perfect being cannot lack anything that's where we get all of the omniscience omnipotence and all sorts of things he seems but, to say here but, like the word guy understand a substance that is infinite and that's all he gives us yeah, here, though, yeah. good uh and uh, just so, as a final point then just before we wrap that up so just and jack said it but the reason why this is called the trademark argument is that the, he says that the because he trademarked I, it yeah, well, so God, well, God he wasn't has, very good at copyright. TM. He definitely did. He should have trademarked What's it. What's TM in French? <laughs> the important thing here TM. is that God, like an artist or a sculpture, has has given a trademark to the to its creation. So the, the fact that I have an idea of God has been placed in me from the creator itself. And this it's important to say that he, he argues, I cannot possibly have conceived of this idea myself. I, this is not something that the human mind, this is not factitious. This is not an mm. imagination. This has to have come from something that has infinite formal reality because I have the objective reality of the idea in my mind. Cool. So let's wrap up this third meditation here. A nice couple of quotes. The whole force of the argument lies in this. I recognize that it would be impossible for me to exist with the kind of nature I have. That is, 
having within me the idea of God, were it not the case that God really exists. By God, I mean the possessor of all perfection. So we start to get a more perfect being rather than just infinite at the end. Quote again, it is clear enough from this that he cannot be a deceiver, since it is manifest by the natural light that all fraud and deception depend on some defect. So later on in the sixth meditation, he really fleshes and caches this out. But we've got this perfect infinite substance. Why? Because I've got the idea of an infinite perfect substance in my mind, and it can only come from a perfect infinite substance. And vitally then moving forward as well is just that from this point onwards, any clear and distinct idea I have is guaranteed its truth because of God's benevolence. Hmm. So because God is not a deceiver, now when I want to say two plus two equals four, I know concretely that that is true without doubt. And that therefore becomes a clear and distinct idea, much like with the cogito. So now we don't have just the cogito as a truth. We can start building. We now have maths and geometry. Well, I'm convinced God exists. Me Hallelujah. Too. What are oh. we doing here? I'm off. William Lane Craig, eat your heart. Uh, we you haven't probably. actually discovered that the outside world is true yet, so you're going nowhere. <laughs> 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 I don't need the outside world. I can just sit here and think about God forever. No, I think about maths, Jack. Ooh, that'd be way more fun. Uh, criticisms, then. Uh, I think if you were found it difficult to follow all of that stuff about objective reality and formal reality is because ultimately, at least in my opinion, it's nonsense. The, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, just just to make this more like to add to an actual point so hobbes in one of his criticisms to descartes says that it makes no sense to talk about levels of reality it's that it's kind of a binary thing it's either something is real or it's not real i can't say there's this thing that's real and then there's this thing that's slightly more real and then i have the most real thing what on earth does that even mean? How do I decide if something is more real or not? Descartes' answer to that is that I'm going to say something is more real if it has more metaphysical independence. Yeah. And and so, as we've said there, with the, the idea of color is not an essential property to the, the, to the mug itself. So I could paint the mug blue and it mm. would still hold the property of what the mug is. And, the, and therefore, the color is, is less real. I still don't buy that. I'm not, I'm not, I can understand why he's trying to say this, but also I, I kind of buy Hobbes. I, I think if something is real or it's not, and we could talk about how we understand these different things within the world and that we might have a clearer perception of certain things and understand certain things better. But to say something, oh, God is more real than me. I don't know what that means. Um, yeah. I, I read the text I read, which was quite helpful. Didn't, they said, oh, well, look, we, what we shouldn't do is think of it in terms of more real or less real and degrees of reality. We should think of it in terms of substantiality. And that's why the, the, the example is substance. And then if you think, I, I, when I was reading it, I was thinking, oh, if you think of it more like things being more substantial and more substance-like and having that metaphysical independence or ontological independence, then it, it's easier to think about, I found. So... I don't go, oh, well, look, my, in a way, the color is less real than the cup that has it, or the sharpness is less real than the knife that is sharp. They're both just as real, but there is a sense in which the sharpness is not as substantial or ontologically dependent in the way that a knife is. Because I need a knife to be sharp, but I, but I don't need sharpness to have mm. a knife. I can have blunt knives, right? Yeah. And good. if you think of it like that, then maybe Descartes thing makes a bit more sense like the less ontologically fundamental or independent can't cause the more ontologically hmm. fundamental or independent something like that i think what you said there is important for the scientific method of explaining things so for instance i mean maybe when i said the color thing let's just be clear here i don't, I don't think there is a good argument to say that color is real in the sense that color is a relationship between light and the mind and all of that stuff whatever i think maybe it's just when we come to talking about substance is that to say that there must be a necessary infinite substance that is more real i don't think he provides clear evidence for that at all and mm. that uh maybe this is just uh, empiricist uh, empiricist leanings on my part of, of 
kind of arguing that I don't see why we need this ontologically like necessity that mm -hmm. cr requires all other things to stem from. Maybe I just have a problem with that in general. Um, it, it, it kind of feels like for me in my head of kind of listening to these arguments that kind of Descartes really fearful of this idea or potentially this kind of like atheist criticism that like someone could just say like, oh, you're just imagining this idea of God. Like it's coming from you. It's coming from a less perfect being and you're imagining this perfect being. Mm -hmm. So correct me if I'm wrong. So he's trying to kind of reverse it right he's saying no it's coming from the perfect <laughs> he was doing just that yeah, yeah. He's, he uh, used that term in he's, the uh, he's he's saying the perfect being is is what comes first and then from that yeah you, you, that's that that's like an uh a uh we we couldn't create the idea of this perfect being it just has to be there because we are imperfect yeah is because right? we have this idea yeah and, yeah and therefore it must come from somewhere Another objection then from Hobbes is that he he claims that God is in fact inconceivable and mm. that any idea that you think you have of God is not actually God. And, yeah. and I think that's an, also an important criticism is that, is it, can I say that I have a clearer and distinct idea of, of God? Well, doesn't Descartes I, himself, you, he, in the text he has, a few he, times, he yeah. says that God's this infinite thing, I'm this finite thing, I can never fully comprehend God. Can you have a clear and distinct idea of something you can't grasp all of its nature of? He gives the example elsewhere in a different text of Descartes and the mountain, and I've given this one a few times. I pick up a few rocks around it, I understand some things about God, perfect, infinite, but Descartes says, I can't get my arms around the full mountain. Is that a necessary condition of understanding a clear and distinct idea? Right, well, then I think maybe my response is, or Hobbes's response could be so Descartes I believe that you think you have a clear understanding of God but I'm not sure you can say it's distinct because mm. it could be confused with a whole bunch of ideas that are kind of like God but maybe not and right. I, I think if you want to say and th remember this is the foundational keystone to everything if I don't have God I, I can't have knowledge of anything and I feel like he just has to say I have this idea of God and trust me on this it's clear and distinct well let's because um, I didn't, don't think we did the step-by-step -step justice there. And just to be clear to the listener then, in the second meditation, we established that we exist. But that thought itself could still be given to you by some kind of deceitful demon. That clear and distinct idea needs to be established by something. And what's it established by? This infinite perfect being that won't be deceitful. Is that not no, the point? No, that isn't the case. Descartes thinks that I can have an array of clear and distinct, distinct ideas. Without God. Without God. But For instance... That I am now thinking, but, that I am now in pain, that I now taste coffee, right? But you can't, so his point is that you can't doubt those things. Yeah, they're self-evident. But, but the God gives you the doubt. truth of them. Just to clear this up. That uh, makes them clear and distinct. He, uh, so what he claims is, is that you can have a clear and distinct idea that is independent of God. This is his response to the Cartesian circle, by the way, which is what we were leaning into there. I need a clear and distinct idea, and then I need God to confirm clear and distinct ideas. And we said at the yeah. beginning, which is that, you know, he said, can't use circular logic. He wants to, his response, I'm not sure how adequate it is, is to say, when I have a clear and distinct idea of, say, the cogito, is that that doesn't actually need God. What God is needed for is for the truth of that to hold throughout time, for instance. That's so, what I was saying, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. So, so, so you can't, you need God to establish the truth of them. You can't doubt that you're a thinking they're, thing. They're true. As the, you as, think it, yeah, good. you cannot doubt a self-evident or undoubtable truth, right. i.e. a clear and distinct idea, as you think it in the moment, is self-evidently true and beyond doubt. Yeah. God establishes the veracity of clear and distinct remembered ideas yeah. right okay good so, so just this is where the cartesian circle comes from is that people go you need god for the, the yeah <laughs> yeah so uh so, a, so just to be absolutely clear on this is the the criticism thrown to descartes here is you want to prove God as a clear and distinct idea, but you also need God to confirm clear and distinct ideas. And that if so, if you if you don't have God, how can we say that we know God to be true without needing God? Therefore, bit of a mess. Uh, his argument to that is, ah, but I can have clear and distinct ideas before I can prove God's existence, but only in the moment I conceive of them. I can't say of what my memory was before that because the evil demon might have deceived me of those truths prior to that point. So so he thinks that once he's got the proof of ex God's existence, suddenly we can stop, we can forget about the evil demon when it comes to clear and distinct ideas and I can remember those truths and I can be absolutely certain of their truth. 
moving, Good. Uh, moving forward. Clear and distinct. Uh, in the <laughs> fifth meditation, it, we have another argument with the existence of God a second time. Uh, and I had some objections to this one, which I think will nicely carry over to the fifth, because um, we want to talk about the fourth meditation in this section as well. So we'll jump into the fourth meditation then. Fourth meditation, truth and falsity. Huzzah! God exists. We're all on the same page. Everything's hunky-dory. We've got I think, therefore I am. We've got mathematics and we've got God. What more could you possibly need, gentlemen? <laughs> I know that's all I need. Um, but obviously <laughs> but obviously, we have like a, a, I guess, a response to Descartes, which he must have gotten some of his letters, which is like, okay, Descartes, so you're saying uh, God exists. You've, you've given your, your trademark argument for it. But why then do we make mistakes? Uh, effectively, you could see this as a version of the problem of evil, right? So if there is this omnipotent God, perfect being, why, why do we make bad decisions? why is there evil um remember this is the problem of evil goes all the way back to uh, epicurus as well in the ancient greeks so this wasn't a new idea but it is obviously a, a, a very strong criticism of belief in god so descartes kind of has a very interesting response to this so that the fourth meditation is actually the shortest out of all the meditations in the entire book that is that, is... Uh, maybe the first one might be but that doesn't matter it's quite short mm, anyway it's very short yeah, yeah okay so let's quote Descartes directly. To begin with, I recognise that it is impossible that God should ever deceive me, for in every case of trickery or deception, some imperfection is to be found. And although the ability to deceive appears to be an indication of cleverness or power, the will to deceive is undoubtedly evidence of malice or weakness, and so cannot apply to God. So, God, why do I see bendy sticks everywhere? Why is it when I lay in the bath and stick my hand in the bath that it looks slightly <laughs> near the surface than it is? Are you playing a wicked game? Are you this evil, malicious demon of so-called from meditation number one? <laughs> <laughs> a very good question. Uh, and just I, I broke down this uh, this argument from that quote into a logical order as well, just to get my head around it. So the problem of error, as it were, is premise mm. one, if God exists and has created in my mind, then I should not make mistakes. Makes sense, right? God is, is God, God is all good. Premise two: I do make mistakes. Conclusion: Therefore, God is God doesn't exist mm. because and, and much that we said here with the problem of evil is the same thing. There is evil in the world. God is supposed to be all good, so either it doesn't add up. Either God isn't all good, or uh, maybe God just doesn't exist at all. So he has to provide some form of theodicy, really, some mm. defense of, on God. It's almost like he just read Augustine and thought, <laughs> I'm going to take this idea and use it. Because Augustine's response to evil is, wait a minute, evil doesn't actually exist. It's a privation. It's a lack of something mm. good. And that's, that's Descartes' response too. He says, error doesn't actually exist not as a real thing it's a privation it's a lack uh, what is it a lack of he says that it is a lack of perhaps our own responsibility of use of free will and a lack of uh, clear and distinct understanding of things so, want, yeah. so he, just to, the nature of my errors or the lack of getting the truth of the matter how do i go wrong well he says that there's two things which which make up my judgments uh, one the faculty of knowledge and two the faculty of choice so the first one the faculty of knowledge is my intellect uh, i can't produce any reason to prove that god ought to have given me a greater faculty of knowledge that's just uh, my reason and reason alone right he says the error occurs in my faculty of choice, in my ability to choose or to do something. So let's say I, you know, I see an I see a stick, an everyday stick. My senses just perceive the stick, and then I judge after the matter, right? So maybe I'm not paying attention to it properly. Maybe I've got other things on my mind. Maybe my judgment doesn't kick in properly. It's my it's down to me rather than something else. My faculties are fine. I'm j I'm just not using them properly. Yeah, it's the it's the misuse of your will so it's it's kind of like this hunger this desire to affirm things that you actually don't fully understand is where you you encroach into the into the realm of error so and i'm sure everybody listening to this has probably been somewhere in a conversation where you've said something where you actually don't know if it's true but yeah but, but i've been gonna... here for three hours <laughs> andrew <laughs> <laughs> i've had that many a times today <laughs> And but you you say it with confidence almost. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the podcast, pretty much since episode one. <laughs> and are you been listening in on my therapist? Yeah. What's going on? Here? And Descartes says the moment that your will affirms something that you don't actually know to be true is where error is prone to to happen. How do we avoid that? It, I, I kind of liken this to the Stoic way of thinking, which is 
don't extend beyond what you know to be reasonable and the moment you do that is where you will lapse into falsity and uh, at least in my head the way i thought about it was just so i have this these clear and distinct ideas whether it's the cogito mass geometry and i have all these safe things that i know to be true the moment i start saying things about the color of this cup and stuff actually while i might my will might affirm it and want to say for sure yes of course i know the cup is yellow actually i can't be so certain about that mm. and then i i, I lapse into error and so that's, that's all it is so effectively we see bendy sticks because we're stupid and overconfident in a way yeah in the like, so and just just to be really certain here then he he gets god off the hook by saying god has provided us with a reasonable set of knowledge that we can have and that in, in fact actually our infinite will is a great thing. It provides us with the ability to choose all of these ideas and to constantly think of new ones. Mm -hmm. But it's our responsibility to rein in our will and be disciplined. That's that's the part of the contract, as it were, between us and God. God can't just give us everything, otherwise there's no free will, and that, that would be a worse reality. So error is allowed in the sense that we make mistakes when we go beyond our, our will. And the same thing then for Augustine with the problem of evil is simply saying... The reason why there is evil in the world is because God wanted to create a world of freedom. That's a, that's the highest good that could be made. Yeah. And so when we decide to do things that cause chaos, it's actually our free choices or the freedom of the world in general that causes that uh, lack of harmony. And therefore, in, or in analogous to Descartes, is the lack of harmony as in the good ideas that we know to be true. Hmm. Once we start reaching beyond that, we cause error or harm to our ideas. Good. He's re he deals with a couple of objections too, doesn't he? A quote, uh, one of them, quote, he could, for example, have endowed my intellect with clear and distinct perception of everything about which I was ever likely to deliberate. So you know, maybe it would be better if God just gave me like this uh, maximum knowledge of everything. So Descartes does consider the possibility of whether he could have made it the case that we only ever do assent to true things. Yeah. So there's two ways to do it. Either giving me a vivid, a clear idea of everything mm. or by forcing me to always remember that I ought not to form opinions on matters vividly, as in mm. forcing me to kind of be stuck. Is it, do, do you say it was a stoic idea of like not assenting to yeah. forcing me to be like that, right? Uh, and Descartes admits if the, he, the God had done this, mm -hmm. then we would be more perfect, yeah. right? But this is where um, you have an issue, right? Well, Descartes saying, well, if you've done these things, then we would be more perfect. So it looks like the Descartes' theodicy doesn't work. But this is where the other parts of the theodicy come in that we haven't mentioned yet. Go on. So he says you also, when you he says... When we're thinking about truth and falsity or the problem of evil, you also have to think about three things. It's uh, why we go wrong. But also, like, he does the classic God moves in mysterious ways. That's yeah. his first one. We can never under understand the reasons of the God. Just in case. He puts that one on the logo. Yeah. <laughs> and the second and the third one is, uh, is something like we can't. We, we shouldn't focus on just ourselves in isolation from the universe. But yeah. We should think of ourselves as connected to the universe so although we might have some evil or some deficiency here maybe it's accounted for somewhere else it's really interesting the quote he gives us i have no right to complain that the role of god wish me to undertake in the world is not the principal one or the most perfect one really interesting response look at the whole of the universe and not just the human condition this is just the it's the book of job it's it's exactly the same theodicy and as greg summed it up as god moves in mysterious ways it is kind of like that he says how am I to judge God for uh, maybe the amount of knowledge that I can have is perfectly adequate for what a human being needs to know. Right. And so anything that any questions that I want to ask beyond that is perhaps just not the place of a human to, to have conception of. And so when you complain about why didn't God give me the knowledge of all things is... Well, you don't understand the bigger picture. But that's the so second. That's, that's, what, that's why that needs to be the way. That's the second point. But the third one's different. The second point is God is infinite and we can't get our head around his motivations. Yeah. The third one is the world wouldn't be better if I were yeah. to have a greater capacity to not go wrong. And I think maybe. And surely isn't that kind of a free will defense in that I should have the freedom to make mistakes. If I knew all things, then I can't actually be free to think and if I'm not free to think, then maybe that isn't perfect. Well, maybe. I, 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 I don't think he's, he's done the legwork in, in the third one, though. That oh, I, I'm not saying that he has. I'm he, just saying that that might be a way of interpreting it. 
Go on, Greg. The one about the universe as a whole, he says, we shouldn't make judgments about what is perfect or imperfect in me on the basis of my intrinsic nature, mm. but as my role or function in the universe as a whole. That's the that's that one. Yeah. Right. Okay. I think that's that's fine. I mean, that's that seems like quite a, a standard theistic response, which is you don't un- because you don't understand the bigger picture. You might what the bad things, as it were, in the so using <laughs> linking into someone someone like Paley, for instance, with the clock, is that just because you don't understand a particular function doesn't mean that it doesn't serve a purpose type thing. Um, mm. Or even if something is broken or appears broken, that that doesn't mean that the whole thing is actually not designed. Yeah, good. Um, maybe I don't want to go on too long or labour it too much. And do, these are any thoughts that are coming to me clearly and distinctly. Maybe they're not clear and distinct to me now. They're, they're muddled and, and, and messy. But the point here, different to the classic theodicies, I can't help but feel that God's this infinitely perfect thing. So I get the theodicy of yeah, we, you can do good or you can do evil, and that's valuable in some sense. But what motivation would a God have for not allowing me to perceive or see things in my observations of the world clearly and distinctly at all times and not be led astray? That seems counter to me being able to make good, well-informed moral decisions. So when Descartes says, no, you've got just as much as you need, if you want to interject some classical theism and, and like Christianity and stuff here, is that... No, I need more of a capacity to see things clearly and distinctly. And you need to give me a positive reason for why the universe wouldn't be a better place if I didn't have this extra ability. I cannot vouch for that last bit. But what I will say is is that he... His point is, is that clear and distinct ideas about mathematics and geometry give you an actual better understanding of the world as it is than through the senses. So God has, if you if you think carefully enough and you're good enough at mathematics, you can start figuring out a whole bunch of really interesting truths about the world. And that, I think, is a really important point, because that's the step away from we say goodbye to all of the final causes and purpose and that fire wants to be with the sun because it's Mm. its best buddy, is that (laughs) now we can explain extension in mathematical formulas. That's where modern science picks up and says, okay, so Descartes got himself muddled up with a whole bunch of stuff. But that's basically what Isaac Newton did. And in that sense, it is good enough. I, I hear you loud and clear, Andrew. But you haven't told me how Jesus fits into this picture <laughs> whatsoever. How much... <laughs> Sorry, so like, so the, re- <laughs> God, the only thing here is that God has apparently provided the human mind with enough to actually understand the fundamental truths of, of reality. Mm. And we just have to work real hard at it. Of course, I think the response back to that is, why didn't God make this easier? <laughs> and perhaps the response back to that is, God doesn't exist. But... Well, was your problem that why was it, why are we still seeing bendy sticks? My my problem was if God is perfect and infinitely good, in if you want to try and wiggle in some classical theism yeah. that God wants us to make moral decisions, it seems counterproductive for God to keep us in the dark about our perceptions of the world, yada yada. Like, why? What reason would a good God have for not allowing us to be more perfect in our observations of things? But. So you mean, why aren't we seeing the stick as it really is? Or why are we still seeing bendy sticks? Why, when I cross the road, I go, hey, Greg, and the you know, person turns around, it's not Greg, it's you know Jesus or somebody or like that. An automaton. An automaton. You're a robot. You're just a, you know, a mannequin or something. Yeah. Why wouldn't God give me infinite knowledge? Omniscience. In a... The, my God, only response God back... God can't give you infinite knowledge if you're not an infinite substance, for one. And also, Descartes saying... That you're in a way your sense impression of the robot. There's nothing <laughs> false. The there's nothing impression. false about your sense impression of the robot. There's nothing false about your sense impression of the bend it's my stick judgment in the water. of the thing. It's the judgment. Yeah. So it's still true that you experience a bendy stick or a robot, but the error, falseness, comes sin, through my judgment evil of the yeah. perception when of you those go, things. And the world looks like that. So if God made me judge if God controlled those judgments, I wouldn't be free. So it cashes out at some yeah, kind yeah. of free will of judgment in the same right. way as the classic theodicies yeah, of morality. And, and that's what I tried to explain earlier. So I, I, I don't think we need to explain more than that, but I just did hammer that point oh, home. That's really is good. That I, my senses might very well tell me the stick is bent, but if I just take... <laughs> what did you say? That my say senses stick. might very well Sorry. tell me that the stick is bent. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with that? <laughs> Sorry. I, I sensed something. I judged yeah. it incorrectly. Ah, <laughs> and that... 
It's very but it meta. doesn't require a whole lot of care, like just a, one moment of careful reflection to think, <laughs> no, it's not. And I think Descartes just wants to say that with a whole bunch of other things we're doing with our senses and just say, are you absolutely certain that that fire contains within it the nature of heat? Yeah. Or is it actually something that the fire does to the atoms on the surface of which they c connect with? And again, just, I know I've said it before, but that's really important when you start thinking scientifically and not scholastically. Yeah, 100%. I, it, and that, that's a really nice way of putting it. I really enjoyed that discussion there. I think with uh, we're good, doing a deep dive of the meditations and also giving some... I like playing that out as well, just there. That wasn't clear to me, and, and now it is. Do we want to speak about some of the objections and responses briefly to this? I only have one I want to discuss, which I don't want to discuss at any length. Uh, really, I rather enjoyed our discussion on the matter, more so than Hobbes's and Descartes on this, where Hobbes says, oh, you ignore the Calvinists in this argument. Maybe it's all deterministic. And Descartes like, that's not the point I'm discussing here a libertarian view of free will, which lots of people take to be important. I wonder how a deterministic view might play out. Not, I imagine the same problems of classic Calvinist determinism come out from our judgments of things as they would from morality and stuff. And maybe it's a there's there's better conversations to have on this outside of this meditation. Yeah, I've, I feel like this is it's an interesting point because Descartes doesn't argue for free will. He just mm. says, and his response to Hobbes is, well. You just know that you have free will because you experience it every day. And if you can't understand that, then you're an idiot. Um, that's not a that's classic day. That's not good enough. Uh, it's, it's, he has to presumably provide us with a good reason. Maybe his, his argument there still falls back onto the theodicy of, of God wouldn't allow us to be deterministic and maybe just wants to reject the Calvinist full stop, bearing in mind that he's not a Calvinist himself. So maybe he just doesn't take that view particularly seriously. Mm. Um, Hobbes he, also points out, he says that uh, knowing and believing have nothing to do with the will. What you hold to be true can, can be something that just happens to you immediately. Uh, you can't help if you, if you think that, that what's in front of you is true or not. You don't necessarily will it to be true. Uh, and I think maybe there's something to that, that when we come to the concept of, of belief that something is true has less to do with you wanting it to be true and it, you just having adopted it immediately. Now, of course, that does not stop people from then defending that position and wanting it to be true. I feel like that's what a lot of arguments for the God's existence have always been about. But I still think that leaves at least a, enough questioning on whether or not falsity is simply a lack or privation. I'm not, I'm not convinced that that is a good way of thinking about error. Something that's not clear nor distinct nor unmysterious is mystery unclear philosopher. Ooh, the mystery philosopher. Welcome to Mystery Philosopher, gentlemen. Are you uh, are you enjoying it in your hats and scarves? I am. Yes, just adding it to my collection of bendy sticks. <laughs> okay, here's your uh, here's your quote for this week. How do you pick up the threads of an old life? How do you go on when in your heart you begin to understand there is no going back? There are some things that time cannot mend, some hurts that go too deep that have taken hold. That's the Lord of the Rings, so J.R.R. Tolkien. It is. Can you give me the book and the character? Uh, it's is it Return of the King. It's Return the of the King, one? and yeah. who says it? Um, it's Frodo Baggins. It's Frodo Baggins. Before well, he goes to uh, the... What is it called? The Grey Havens? Yeah, yeah, before he disappears off on his <laughs> off on his journey, off on his boat with his sword. What troubles await him? You'll have to wait until my fan written sequel. Um, that's one all across the board. <laughs> that's one apiece, all equal, all all level at the at the death. Frodo Baggins isn't a philosopher, Jack. So in the next instalment, we'll play our final. <laughs> or is he? Because actually, I a random weird link here uh, is that I, Frodo Baggins. I, one of the introductions I read of of, of the meditations is it says that Reveals it describes it. it describes the meditations as a there and back again story. Oh, that, like that's a nice the, way. Of... Much like the Hobbit. Lovely. So, oh, that's that is nice, isn't it? There you go. Made so, that link. So maybe the the Lord of the Rings is what it, it, we can have a day a Cartesian reading of the Lord of the Rings. I that's Almost the only way to read it, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So next week we won't be doing parts five and six. The meditations will be reading uh, the Fellowship of the Ring. So <laughs> from start to finish, <laughs> yeah. take us a while. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sci Cast. 
The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pansai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash PansaiCast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>